Hey, we're in Exodus. Mike left off in Exodus chapter 21. So turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 21. And I believe he left off at verse uh, 21, verse 21. So we're in Exodus 21, verse 22. And thanks, Mike, for leaving off at this point of Scripture because it's some very difficult Scripture. And he's throwing me into the, not the Ark of, Ark of the Covenant as much of, of the, the baptism of uh, interesting Scripture here. But it's interesting because, let me give you a little context. Uh, Moses is up on Mount Sinai. He's getting the Mosaic Law, which started with the Ten Commandments, right, which is the moral guidelines for God's people. Uh, moral guidelines that are still, I believe, in place for us today. As Mike has exposited that, he made it very clear that they're all found within the New Covenant except for the Sabbath. But the other nine of the Ten Commandments are there, specifically taught by Jesus in this Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus actually took those Ten Commandments and affirmed them for us today, but then he took them to another level. He said, the law says this, but I say that. And so he, he affirmed the Ten Commandments, but then he said, but we're taking them to a whole other level in the New Covenant. The law says you shall not murder. I say you shall not even be angry with your brother in the heart, because anger is where murder starts. The law says you shall not commit adultery. He affirmed that. That's one of the moral guidelines. Don't commit adultery. But I say, what did he say? If you lust after a woman in your heart, that's like you're committing adultery in your heart. It all starts in the heart. So in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew uh, 5 through 7, he affirmed these Ten Commandments, but then he upped the Ten Commandments to go not just to the outer, but to the inner. And then after he gets the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, what we're seeing now is in 21 and 22, Exodus 21 and 22, what he's doing now is he's getting the laws, the Mosaic law for the two to three million people that are with Moses for 40 years in the desert. And if you remember that what happened there was he met with his, as he was in the wilderness with these two to three million people of God, he met with his father-in-law. What was his father-in-law name? Hint, think of Beverly Hillbillies. Jethro, some of you are too young to remember Beverly Hillbillies, but Jethro was, anyways, Jethro, the original Jethro was Moses' father-in-law, and he met with Moses, and he saw that Moses, as he was the leader of God's people for these 40 years in the wilderness, he was listening and bringing judgment to all their cases that were brought to him from sun up to sun down, and so Jethro told uh, his father-in-law told Moses, this is too much. You're trying to be the judge for two to three million people. And every time something happens when these two to three million people, they got to bring their matter to you, and you got to bring the judgment. So what did, what did Jethro tell his son-in-law to do? Do you remember? Raise up leaders. Raise up leaders of hundreds, leaders of thousands, and then the real, real, real you know, really tough cases, I'll deal with. But all the other cases, it's on those leaders of tens, hundreds, or thousands. And they'll be the judge. And so it was the delegation of leadership is what, what's, what's happening here. And so what God is now doing for Moses is he's giving case after case of how to deal with these two to three million people in a, in a fair, just way, how to legislate this law with these judges for the next 40 years. And so this is the law book. This is the justice system that we're looking at that God gives to Moses to give to his judges. And so Moses, most scholars believe, at least conservative scholars believe, that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, including Exodus. And so what Moses is writing down here in the book of Exodus is the laws that were given to him by God on Mount Sinai to give to the judges so they could legislate justice to God's people. And so we're going to see a continuation of these laws now. And think about this because God is a God of love. He's a God of grace. But he's also a God of justice. And he has told us in Micah 6, 6 8, he says, he has shown the old man what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do what? Justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And so as we go through these principles of justice, of judgment, of how to deal in interaction with other people. There's a lot of practical principles for us, too. How do you deal in a just way with other people? Because he has shown the old man what the Lord requires of us, but to do justice. 
will not only be people of kindness and mercy and grace and love, that's all a part of being a, a person of God, a Christian, but another part of being a Christian is to interact with one another in just ways, in ways that are just and fair. And so we're going to see a lot of these principles tonight. So with that background in mind, you ready to jump back in to the, to the, to the Ark of the Covenant laws here given to God's people? If, if you're in Exodus 21, verse 22, say amen. amen. Okay, here we go. If, a, if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there's no injury, he shall surely be fine as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there's any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty of life for life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, foot for a foot, this is interesting, burn for a burn, wound for a wound, bruise for a bruise. Now, first of all, it's talking about a men, a men struggling with each other in, in their fight, maybe, in the fist fight, the, they get, the, the wife jumps in. I've, I've been, uh, we have several cops in our church, and they tell me one of the worst calls they ever get is domestic violence. Because they'll get there, and then they'll get in the middle of the husband and wife that are hitting each other, and all of a sudden, they're the bad guy. And then they get, they get hit by the wife, and they're trying to help the wife, and the wife hits them. And that's kind of what's being described here is you've got a struggle going on and between two men. And the woman gets right involved and she might be pregnant and then she loses the baby. And then what it says, okay, this judge is being told now by Moses' law, the way you deal with it is you deal with a husband. And you deal with, with retribution back to those. These are laws of retribution. But it also says, hey, if someone hurts someone and takes out their eye, an eye for an eye, takes out your tooth, a tooth for a tooth, Right? A burn for a burn. I wonder how you legislate that. Okay, you gave him a burn right here. Get the cigarette out. We'll get a, get a burn right back, right right back in there. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, burn for a wound, a, 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 a wound for a wound, and a bruise for a bruise. And also, listen, a life for a life. You know, when I was a young Christian, I still had some Chicago liberal views. And one of them was capital punishment is just wrong. It's absolutely wrong. It's just not, it's not right for us to take a life. That's God's job to take a life. We're not to be God. I kept punishing what's wrong. And then, for the first time, I read through the Old Testament as a new Christian. I realized that the New Testament is very clear. Capital punishment is a biblical justice. If someone takes a life in murder, now not manslaughter, I'm talking about murder, there's plenty of scripture that points to the fact a life for a life. And if someone kills somebody, premeditatedly kills somebody, Scripture is clear, a life for a life. And I think that capital punishment is put on the shelf, and I understand why, because sometimes it's not just when the wrong person gets executed and there's mistakes, and that. I don't, I be very careful with that, but hey, the Bible's very clear, a life for a life, tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. Now, um, I think one of the reasons why this is legislated in this way, too, is because sometimes when someone hurts somebody else, that somebody else wants to hurt him back and then hurt him back even worse. You know, someone punches somebody out and the next thing you know, the other person wants to kill that person. The Bible says, no, that's not just. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's it. But Jesus even changed that in the new covenant. Remember what Jesus said? You've heard. He said in the law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say, if someone hits you, what do you say to do? Turn the other cheek. And then he says, if you have an enemy, pray for that enemy. Love that enemy. Turn that enemy into a friend. That's the new covenant, by the way. It's a covenant of grace. And the best way to deal with an enemy is to do what Jesus did on the cross. And what did he do with those enemies that were killing him? Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. And I tell you what. In this new covenant of grace that we're in, the best way to deal with people that are attacking you is to love them, pray for them, forgive them. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Jesus set a whole new gold standard in our interaction with other people. When people attack us, we love them back. And we kill them with kindness. Because that's what he did. Isn't it? And that's why that that centurion at the cross, when he saw Jesus praying for the people that were killing him, the centurion said, truly, this was the Son of God. Because he saw divinity and humanity the way Jesus interacted with those people that were killing him. 
That's Christ-like. That's what we're called to be as followers of Christ, right? And I tell you what, forgiveness is the way to go too because you know what? You're praying for somebody that's hating on you and attacking you and doing stuff to you. It, it just keeps your soft heart. It keeps your heart soft. I mean, it keeps you from getting into the bitterness and anger yourself because you're praying for those that are persecuting you and you're loving them instead of hating them. We're supposed to overcome evil with good. In the, in the Romans chapter 12 tells us that. In Romans 12 also tells, it says we're supposed to bless those who curse us. And if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men, right? So let's go on. Verse 20, um, 26. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and destroys it, he shall let, it, let him go on account of his eye. And if he knocks out a tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go on, on account of his tooth. So what he's saying there, in the slaves, if the slaves are being abused by the master, the just system says that if your slave, if you do abuse to your slave, you knock his tooth out, you show abuse physically to him, he gets freedom. Freedom. Because of the way you've treated him. A little bit different than the kind of slavery that's going on in this country, pre-Civil War, huh? And then it goes on, verse 28. If an ox gores a man of, or a woman to death, the ox will surely be stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall go unpunished. If, however, an ox was previously in the habit of goring and its owner has been warned, yet he does not confine this ox, and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner shall also be put to what? That's simply saying animal control. And it's saying if you have an oxen, and if for the first time it gets loose or something, and they gore somebody and kill somebody, then you kill the oxen, you get rid of the oxen. But if you're an animal owner, you don't kill the oxen after it's already killed somebody else, and then it goes and kills somebody else, what does it say to do? Kill the oxen, and then your life is required too, a life for life again, right? Kind of reminds me of some of these people that uh, have aggressive dogs. And they, their dog just attacks somebody and gives someone 100 stitches. And then they let that same dog out and it happens again. We had, uh, uh, where we used to live, I used to live off a road called Devil's Backbone. Can you believe Pastor John lived off the Devil's Backbone? But we'd walk down, we'd go off Devil's Backbone and then it was Horse Creek and then it was Oak Circle where we lived. But right in between Devil's Backbone and Oak Circle there was a road, it was Horse Creek. And we always used to walk our dog down Horse Creek and drove Heidi crazy because there was these property owners halfway down the walk that had this white aggressive dog and that dog would run out and do circles around us and they have snarling fangs and Heidi, Heidi's, Heidi's pretty, pretty bold and what, I mean, she's not afraid to confront situations ladies you know that and so after, the, after this happened, she went and she talked to the owner of this dog and said, you've got to push your dog on a leash. I walk in my dog, and it feels like I'm going to get attacked just walking down our neighborhood road right here. And so talked to the owner, and I think maybe for one or two weeks, the dog was on a leash. And then a couple weeks later, guess what? Pearl, the dog, was off the leash again. So she comes back, and she says, give me one of your golf clubs. And so... She, she had, to, every time she'd walk her dog by herself, she'd have one of my golf clubs or a shaft for my golf club, and it's like this, you know? And, but it kept happening. This dog kept running all across the yard, you know, fangs, and just scaring the dickens out of my wife, like she's going to get, like, attacked by this dog. So I, after one of those times that happened, I'd go, okay, let's, let's, get, uh, let's get my pit bull. Let's go for a walk, pit bull. And I, I had this chocolate, we, it's Chaco was Pitbull's name at the time, and so I took Chaco down this road, and I'm just kind of walking, you know, walking Chaco, and I get Chaco down to Pearl's home, and sure enough, Pearl's running across the thing like this, and I had one of those leashes that goes about 30 feet, if you let it, and so, so, so Pearl comes chasing after me, and it, Pearl wants to scare the dickens out of me, and fangs, and rah, like this, and so I said, okay, Chaco just cool, and Chaco was one of those dogs that didn't bark, but she, he was stealth. And so as soon as that dog got going across the ditch, I let the leash go. And I've never seen a dog so scared in my life. And, and, and Chaco went, jumped across the ditch and chased that dog as far as the leash would let her, about 30 feet, right back to her front porch. And this dog had his tail being between his legs like this, and went, like this, and ran back up to the porch. And uh, 
I, I would love to say that Pearl never uh, went after Heidi again, but anyways, that's part of the story, but, but, but that's kind of what this is talking about here. This is talking about animal control, and by the way, good for us, hey, if you have an animal that's aggressive at all, be careful with that animal. Don't put that animal in harm's way of anybody. Protect people from your animal if it's, if it's keep your animal on a leash. Anyways, that's just in our culture, right? Animal control, I think, it's even in our culture today, it's important. Okay, let's go on. Um, verse 28, if an ox uh, gores a man or woman to death, but the ox shall surely be stoned in flesh, we've already done that part, owner shall be put to death. Verse 30, if a ransom is demanded of him, then he shall give for the red redemption of his life whatever is demanded of him. Whether it gores a son or daughter, it shall be done to him according to the same rule. If the ox gores a male or female slave, the owner shall give his or her master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Now, that's interesting to me, because what did Judas get for giving up Jesus? 30 shekels of silver. So there's a little bit of a, a little prophetic um, allegory going on here, because if this, if this, fem if this slave... If the ox gores a male or female slave, owner has to give up 30 shekels of silver, and then the ox shall be stoned too, the ox that killed the slave. And what's the, it's a, this is pushing it, but the allegory there a little bit is Jesus was given up for us for 30 shekels of silver, but ultimately the ox, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion, who tried to kill Jesus, who did kill Jesus, ultimately was, was stoned by Jesus or conquered by Jesus on the cross. Because when he died on the cross, he disarmed the powers and the principalities of hell. A little bit of a stretch, but there's a little bit of, little bit of allegory going all the way prophetically to the New Testament right there. All right? And then it goes in verse 33, if a man opens a pit or digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall give its money to its owner, and the dead animal shall become his. Again, justice. If one man's ox hurts another so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox, divide the price equally. Also, they shall divide the dead ox. Or if it is known that the ox was previously in the habit of goring, yet its owner had not confined it, he shall pay ox for ox. The dead animal shall become his. Justice again. Here's what we're learning in all those different laws of retribution. What was the main business of Israel at the time? Livestock, farming. So these are business things. And what he's saying here is God's people do your business with integrity and fairness. The worst witness we can have is God's people if we don't do our business in justice and integrity and with fairness, right? Part of the best part of our witness as Christians is we deal with people in just and fair ways in our jobs, our business, and what we do. Don't be ripping people off and then saying, praise the Lord. Be people of integrity in your dealings with other people, especially out there in the marketplace, especially in our business. Amen? And then it goes on, chapter 22. If a man steals an ox or a sheep or slaughters it and sells it, he shall pay five oxen for the ox, four sheep for, for, the, uh, for the sheep. Interesting. He steals one ox. How, what's, the, what's the payback he's got to make to make retribution? Five ox. Interesting. And then steals a sheep, four sheep for the sheep. And so it's, it's retribution times five or four. And if the thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltness on his account. You know what that's saying? If someone's coming in and stealing from your house and you pull out your uh, nine millimeter and you shoot them, no retribution. No, no you manslaughter going to prison for it. It's only fair because someone is coming in to steal from you and you're protecting your home. A little bit different than our culture today, isn't it? But that's what biblically it says the way it should go. But if the sun is risen on him, there will be blood, blood, blood guiltness on his account. He shall surely make restitution if he owns nothing. Then he should be sold for his theft. And if what he stole is actually found alive in his possession, whether on an ox or donkey or a sheep, he, sh 
he shall pay what? He shall pay what? Interesting. You know what this is saying? It's saying justice is if someone wrongs you, not only do you make things right, but you make it right double or four times or five times. You know what this is leaning towards with God's justice? Is if you wrong somebody, that, that the person that should be made right is the person that was victimized by your wrongdoing. You know the culture we're living in is skewed the other way? At least in my opinion. Our culture is skewed another way in regards to oftentimes the justice is going the other way. The person that did the wrong gets more justice than the person that was victimized. So listen to my pastor, Pastor Chuck, founder of Recovery Chapel, and he was talking about uh, when he was teaching through this section of scripture, he was talking about that week in his area of Costa Mesa, California, a lady had been taken from a parking lot and she had been thrown into a van and this guy took her back to his apartment, right, and physically raped her and the neighbors called the police and the police came and could hear her screaming through the door and so the police broke the door down and went in there and rescued her from this guy that was raping her because she was screaming out so loud. The neighbors called the police in. And then what happened in the news report was this rapist got off scot-free because they didn't get permission to go into his apartment and they invaded his rights by breaking the door down. I'm going, that's crazy. It's, yeah, that's California. I'm, God bless you guys from California. I'm sorry. But... But, no, that's our culture that we're living in. And it's, it's skewed towards the wrongdoer rather than the victim. And I'm telling you what, even though I'm a pastor, if that was my daughter, I would pull a Clint Eastwood and go find the guy. Yeah, you'd help me. and we, We'd go get some justice. Because that's not justice. That is not justice to let a rapist go who kidnapped this lady and just because his door is broken down without a warrant or whatever else, to get off scot-free. It's, that's not justice. Justice is skewed. If it's going to be skewed one way, get it towards the people that are being victimized rather than the person doing the wrongdoing. That's what Scripture is saying right here. Verse 5, And if a man lets a field or vineyard be grazed bare and lets his animal loose so that it grazes in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. And a fire breaks out and spreads to thorn brush bushes so that stacked grain or the standing grain or the field itself is consumed. He who has started the fire shall surely make restitution. In other words, if you do things that are causing vandalism or causing destruction to other people's property, you should be held responsible. And that's just law. We should be careful with other people's stuff. And if we cause destruction to other people's stuff, we should be responsible for the destruction that we cause. Verse 7, if a man gives his neighbor money or goods to keep for him and is stolen from his man's house, if the thief is caught, he shall pay double. Again, restitution, double restitution. If the thief is not caught, then the owner of the house shall appear before the judges to determine whether he laid his hands on his neighbor's property. Now notice, this is interesting here. So if the thief's not caught, the owner of the house appears before who? Judges. Notice the plurality of that. Judges. Why is it judges? Because it's not Moses alone anymore. And it's saying, okay, now go to all these judges that have been ordained by Moses and get justice with the two to three million people. I'm sure there was a lot of legal cases with two or three million people camping out in the wilderness together for 40 years. There were some issues. As you ladies say, there was some drama. And when the drama would happen, he said, okay, go to the judges that have been appointed by Moses and work out the drama. Work out the issues. Now, it's different in the New How's it different? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 says that if you're in a church and there's drama and there's issues, don't go to the legal courts, the pagan legal courts, to work out those issues. Go, if necessary, go to the leadership of the church. Get the pastors involved. Get the elders involved. Because you don't want to bring your drama, your issues to a pagan court and, and then, oh, praise the Lord, we're both brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're on Judge Judy together. No, don't do that. Especially Judge Judy, because that will be broadcast nationally. 
Oh, praise the Lord, we go to church together, but we're suing each other. That's not a good thing. It's better for us to work it out and not go to the judges here in this new covenant that we're in. Amen? And hey, by the way, if you got an issue with somebody else, don't sweep it under the carpet. I love living here in the South. Been here 24 years. I think I'm finally learning how to say y'all right. I don't, I don't get that phrase I first got the first few years when I moved here from Chicago. They'd say, do what now? Because I didn't talk, or they'd say this to me, I'd say, you're not from around here, are you? But I, so I love the South. I'm, I'm here to stay. I am, I'm, I'm here 24 years, and so I love the South. But one thing I do see here in the South sometimes is things get pushed under the carpet. If you're in, you know, bless your heart. Bless your heart, but as soon as you leave, I'm going to trash you with somebody else because I'm upset with you, but bless your heart. That's not how we handle it. The Bible says, don't let your, Ephesians 4, don't let your son go down in your anger, right? And the Bible says, speak the truth and love to one another. And if you've got an issue with somebody else, if you've got drama with somebody else, especially within the church, talk to them. Bring it to them. And if you need to, have a mediator if it gets to that point where if it, leads, if it elevates to that point that you've got to have a pastor, just, hey, talk to Pastor Mike anytime you want. Get him involved. <laughs> Where's Pastor Mike at? God bless you, Mike. He's, he's very available. Get him involved and, and, and help him mediate. But me, get a, work it out, man. We're family, Right? What family does is when there's drama in family, you don't just sweep it under the rug. You, get, you, you talk it out, you forgive each other, and then you're brothers and sisters again, and you love each other again because you worked it out, right? If possible, so far as it depends on all men, be at peace. And part of being peace is working things through, talking things through, forgiving each other, and then love covers a multitude of sins. Amen? And that's what it's talking about right here. Go to the judge, work it out. For every breach of trust, verse 9, whether it's an ox, for a donkey, for sheep, for clothing, or any lost thing about which one says this is it, the case of both parties shall come before the judges. There it is. Come before the judges. And he whom the judge condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. He'll get retribution there. In verse 10, if a man gives his neighbor or a donkey, an ox, or a sheep, or an animal to keep for him, and it dies or is hurt or driven away while no one is looking, an oath before the Lord shall be made by the two of them that he has not laid hands on his neighbor's property and his owner shall accept it. He shall not make restitution. In other words, they've worked it out. The restitution's worked out. But if he is actually stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. For if it is all torn into pieces, let him bring in his evidence. He shall not make restitution for what has been torn to pieces. It's interesting. You, to, you tore my animals to pieces, let's take it in pieces to the judge. See, this is what this neighbor did. This piece is here, this head's right here, and it kind of reminds me of somebody, you know, hits a deer in the road. And I'll never forget, on one of these Wednesday nights, I get a call from my son. He just started driving in his pickup truck. And he said, Dad, I got an accident. Oh, no. And so I rushed over there to the accident, and he, the accident wasn't with a car. It was with like a 12-point buck. And he had part of the buck on his, on his uh, bumper, and another part was on the ground. It was just in pieces. The thing that was amazing to me is by the time I got there, there was guys with a camouflage on and a pickup truck taking the pieces and going away with the duck. I'm going only in South Carolina. No cleanup required. Roadkill is gone. But that's kind of, he said, take these pieces, take these pieces and, and work it out. Verse 14, <laughs> If a man borrows anything from his neighbor and it's injured or dies while its owner is not with it, he shall make full restitution. If his owner is with it, he shall not make restitution. If it is hired, it has come for its hire. Now look at verse 16. This is laws, now sundry laws are called. If a man seduces a virgin who's not engaged and lies with her, he must pay a what? A dowry for her to be his wife. And if her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the dowry for virgins. Now, <laughs> this really cut down on premarital uh, sex. Because if you had sexual relations according to the law with a virgin, automatically you're going to get married. And not only are you going to get married, you're going to come up with a dowry 
to pay the father. And so you had to think twice about this intimacy thing. <laughs> and, and our culture is so messed up right now. I can't believe how messed up even kids that are in church have issues with this sexual purity thing because they're so influenced by the culture that's around us and saying, hey, you know, best friends with benefits. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. That's okay just to have all these best friends and the benefits are is you could be impure with all these all these friends. That's not the biblical model for what intimacy is for. It's supposed to be within the covenant marriage relationship. You're supposed to be only, and it's a beautiful gift. Sexual intimacy is given to us as a gift from God for pleasure, for closeness and relationship, for procreation. But when it's outside of a marriage relationship, it's wrong. And, it's, and even in the law that's given to God's people here, it says if you make that wrong decision to do that outside of marriage, then you get married, and not only you get married, you pay a dowry to your, the father-in-law. And so it put a, a real restriction there on this intimacy before marriage stuff. This premarital fornication was limited because you had to, as soon as it happened, you had to get married, and you had to come up with money to pay the dowry to the father-in-law. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to do that, do that nowadays, huh? Bam, you're married. And it's interesting, uh, our, our Calvary Chapel that we're kind of a sister church with up in Pennsylvania, it's actually Lebanon, Pennsylvania. It's a great church. It's a booming Calvary Chapel. They have, like us, they have a, a U-Turn for Christ ranch. They kind of followed our model. And now they not only have a U-Turn for Christ men's ranch, they've got a U-Turn for Christ women's ranch. And there are over 1,000 people in that church now. But the pastor uh, realized that a lot of these young people, young couples that were coming to his church, they were all living together. And he had dozens of couples that were coming every Sunday. And he's, well, what's your name? And his last name was different than her last name. And they're living in the same address. And dozens of them. So you know what the pastor did? The pastor said, well, why, why aren't you guys married? You're coming with your Bibles and you're studying the scripture with us and you're living together. And they said, well, we, we can't afford to get married. We don't have the money to put on a ceremony and a reception and all this other stuff. And hear that over and over and over again. The excuse was, we got to live together because we don't have the money to do a full wedding and we can't afford the reception, the food, everything else. So you know what the pastor in Lebanon did? He said, it was in one of the Cover Chapel magazines, I saw pictures of it. He said, okay, all you couples that are living together and say you can't afford to get married, guess what? We're going to have a wedding in two months and you're all going to get married. And they did a mass wedding for all these couples that couldn't afford to pay for a wedding. And I think it was like something like 20 plus couples all got married at the ceremony. And the church paid for the whole thing. They took the excuse away. And they, they, they did a huge reception for all these couples too. And they paid for all the food. And these 20 plus couples all got married. It was awesome. And that's biblical. Because what does Corinthians say? It's better to... Marry than to burn. And if you're in, 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 uh, in more immorality, get married, man. And I'll do that too. I'll, if someone comes to me and, you know, they're, they're, they, 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 you know, want to do a wedding and they've been living together, everything else, some pastors won't marry them. I'm just the opposite. Let's get it done. As they say here in the South, let's get her done. Let's get right now, today, let's get it done. And I've done that several times. I've had uh, just a wedding right in my office with people that started coming to church and they're living together and they want to get things right. I'll help you get it right. So if you're here tonight and you're living together, hey, tomorrow I'm available. <laughs> Let's get her done. And you, you don't have to come up with a dowry for your bride either. You don't even have to pay me. Just let's get her done. Because it's better to marry than to burn, right? Okay, let's go on with the sundry laws. Um, Verse 18, you shall not allow a sorceress to what? Live. Sorceress. Witchcraft. Interesting, because a part of the pagan culture at that time was sorcery. It was prevalent throughout the pagan Canaanite culture that was all around them. And by the way, in our pagan culture today, it's starting to become more and more prevalent. Even among Christians. Now, I've talked to Christians that were so bummed out about losing a parent, a mother or father, 
They went to mediums so these mediums could help them communicate with the dead so they could have a relationship with their mom or dad again. And, I've, and that's, They're not communicating with mom or dad. They're, they're communicating with demons. I've, I've heard of Christians calling, were so in need of counsel, they called psychic hotlines. That's demonic. Don't, don't do that, Christians. I've heard of Christians for fun playing with tarot cards. That's demonic. Don't do that. Even horoscopes. Stay away from that stuff. That's demonic. That's astrology. That's wrong. Stay away from that. A couple of scriptures down. Let's look at it. Because it's all throughout the law that we're to stay away from this stuff as God's people. Leviticus 19.31. Throw it up on the screen right there. Do not turn to mediums or spirits. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord, your God. Uh, Leviticus 20, verse 27, also speaks about this. Now a man or woman who is a medium or a spirit so surely be put to death. Those should be stoned with stones. Their blood guiltness is upon them. God takes this stuff seriously. Look at Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 12. It says, when you enter the land which the Lord God gives you, you shall not learn to uh, imitate the detestable things of those nations. There shall not be found any among you who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. That's like the, to the uh, false god of Molech. Or one who uses divination. Or one who practices witchcraft. Or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer. Or one who casts a spell or a medium or a spiritist. Or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is what? detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. And there's a couple things about mediums, psychic hotlines, everything else. Yeah, a lot of it is scam, a lot of it's con artists, a lot of it's just baloney. But there is some power there. There is some demonic power that's given to these people, and you need to stay away from it because those demons are, are real. I was watching a talk show. I was channel surfing and watching a talk show. And it was um, kind of like an Oprah talk show, but it wasn't Oprah. It was another talk show host. And she had one of these mediums on the uh, talk show. And this medium was, was talking to people that were standing up. And they had one by one standing up. And he, he was a medium for their dead relatives, like we were talking about. And it was interesting to me. Because I don't think he was really speaking for that dead father or dead mother. But he was giving intimate details to that person about this, that only that father or mother might know about that person. And these people were just weeping as they were hearing these intimate details from their father or mother. Now, I don't think that was their father or mother speaking through that medium. But I think it was demons. Because demons have the ability to have knowledge about some things like that, and they were passing that knowledge on and then counterfeiting as mom or dad. But that's demonic. We're not to have anything to do with demons like that. We're to stay a country mile away from that stuff because here's what happens. You expose yourself to stuff like that, and those demons are real, and you expose and you open up uh, to demonic oppression, and that could jump on you and give you some heart, some issues, spiritual warfare in your life. So stay away from all that stuff. And if there's sorcery going on in the Old Testament, it says, you're to take that sorcerer out. They're not to live. Verse 19, whoever, <laughs> oh boy, Mike, this should be your chapter. <laughs> whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. Let's move on. <laughs> That's very understandable. That, that needs no exegesis whatsoever. Just stay, just, but hey, listen, that's how pagan the culture was around them. People were doing this stuff. And says, as God's people, don't be conformed to this world. Don't, <laughs> I mean, that's how twisted the world can get. Because the pagan culture was doing that stuff. Let's move on. Verse 20. <laughs> he who sacrifices to any God other than the Lord alone shall be utterly destroyed. Now, look at this. This is idolatry. And it's talking about capital punishment for sorcerers. Those who practice witchcraft, capital punishment. Those who practice bestiality, capital punishment, put to death. But those among God's people that are sacrificing to false gods, capital punishment. Wow. God takes idolatry very seriously. And that's why he tells us in Matthew 6.33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So all these things will be added. Don't put other things before God in your life because that's idolatry. Verse 21, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. 
you shall not afflict any widow or orphan. If you afflict them at all, and if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry, and my anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows, and your children fatherless. Got to see this, church. Give me your attention here. God has a strong love and heart for the stranger, for the widow, and for the orphan. And if we mistreat these people, God takes that seriously. Because God loves the poor. He loves the helpless. He loves to help the helpless. And if we're going to have God's heart, we should love the helpless too. You know what real love is? It's loving and helping people that can't even help you back. Jesus says even the pagans know how to love people that love them. But our job is to help people that really need the help. The widows, the orphans, the strangers, which in our culture would be people that are um, immigrants into our culture, strangers. You know, we've been, a couple Sundays now, we've been doing this thing for Compassion. Compassion is one of the best organizations in the world to help orphans, to help the helpless, to help people that are kids in third world countries that need food, need education, need support. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you tonight. This is our last opportunity tonight to sign up and sponsor a kid. And if you, Heidi and I for decades now have sponsored a kid with compassion. It's awesome because you're helping someone that's helpless. And so we're going to watch a little video. And then after this Bible study, I'm just about done with all the laws of retribution and everything. So just a couple more minutes. Then we're going to have some ice cream. But, hey, we're going to have a little computer over there. It's all already set up. We're going to have uh, Brent and Lori that are in charge of this compassion ministry that we're doing. They're going to be standing over there underneath the ministry signups. And go over there and check it out. And please, pray. Just pray even right now as we're closing this Bible study. Pray about whether you're supposed to help an orphan, help a kid in a third world country. That just for what you would pay for Starbucks for a few weeks per month, you're going to be helping a kid change the trajectory, trajectory of their life and support them. We've already got 15 uh, families in the church that have already signed on to support uh, a kid through Compassion International. How about we get 15 more tonight? And then we'll double it. We'll have 30 kids where their lives will be changed because you support them. And they'll write letters to you and they'll tell you how you're helping them. And there'll be a connection to a whole other country through doing that. So let's watch this video. Let's give you an idea how that works. The church is God's hope for the world. And right now, there are over 400 million children across the world living in extreme poverty. 400 million children in need of hope. This is why Compassion International exists. For over 60 years, Compassion has partnered with the church to release children from poverty in Jesus' name. At its core, Compassion is a child development organization that cares for children in poverty through child sponsorship. But this kind of sponsorship looks different with Compassion. So what does different look like? First, it looks like the church working together. We partner with churches in the U.S. to sponsor children and with over 6,000 churches in developing nations to deliver resources and programming to those children throughout their entire childhood. This kind of sponsorship looks like relationships. Compassion connects one child with one sponsor to help the child achieve his or her God-given potential. The relational investment made through a sponsor's letter to their child is often the thing that helps that child believe that they don't have to live in poverty forever. This kind of sponsorship looks like holistic care. Children sponsored through Compassion receive physical care, educational care, social care, and most importantly, spiritual care, all from their local church. In the last year alone, over 125,000 children made first-time decisions to follow Jesus. That's one every four minutes. And for your church, this kind of sponsorship looks like the Great Commission. By partnering with Compassion, your entire church is equipped to serve as global missionaries. And the result is that powerful transformation takes place on both sides. Children meet Jesus and are discipled in the local church. And here in the U.S., sponsors in your church become more globally aware, more engaged, and more generous. This is what sponsorship with Compassion looks like. Releasing children from poverty through compassion in, in what? In Jesus' name. So, Brent Lloyd, how much is it per month to sponsor one kid per month? 
$38. That's less than some of us spend on Dunkin' Donut coffee every month. And you know, I, no guilt trip if you like Dunkin' Donuts, sorry. But hey, let's pray about that right now. And, and we're going to close up Bible study. I've got a few more verses that will close up. But let's pray about, let's, 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 let's see if we can get some more sponsors tonight. Heidi and I are going to sponsor another kid. Heidi, I get your approval back there. We're going to add another kid to our sponsorship. So we're, we're one of the 15 if we can get 15 more tonight. And uh, let's see what God does with that. Close up the Bible study now. Let's go. If you lend money to my people. Oh, by the way, James 1.17. Let's throw that up there too. This verifies what I'm saying about orphans and widows. Come on. James 1.17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation. That's the wrong verse, but that's a good verse too. This is true, and un I'm going to turn to my Bible to James to make sure I get the right verse here. This is true and undefiled religion is to help widows and orphans in their need is basically what it says. All right. Hey, it's 27, not verse 17. 127, uh, typo. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You want, to, you want to see true Christianity? Visit and help widows and orphans. Amen? Amen. James 1.27. Let's close up our chapter. Verse 25. If you lend money to my people, to the poor among you, you're not to act as a creditor to him. You shall not charge him interest. If you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you're to return it to him before the sun sets. For that is his only covering. It is his cloak for his body. What else shall he sleep in? And it shall come about that when he cries out to me, I will hear him. For I am, what is God? This is Old Testament, by the way. What does God say he is? I am gracious. Now, that's interesting. He's saying those that are wealthy among God's people, if you feel led to help somebody, don't take advantage of the person you're helping. And one of the ways you could do that is if you give a loan out to somebody, don't charge them interest. If you have the ability to help them resource, say, hey, even better yet, if you're able to help somebody and just give them a gift, do that. And if, if, if you have their cloak, their coke as, as, as a pledge for what they've loaned you for, give it back to them just at nighttime so they could have something warm to sleep with is what it's saying there. Now, whenever I read these verses in the Old Testament about with God's people, you don't charge interest if you loan them money, I think of my grandpa Hoppy, the guy I'm named after, John G. Hoppy Sr., because he came here when he was seven years old with his mom on a ship from Amsterdam, and they, they traveled to meet their, uh, his dad, her, her husband, who had already been here a year working in the Chicago stockyards. And they came over, and they had nothing, they didn't speak a lick of English, they got sent from Ellis Island to Chicago where my great-grandpa was at. And my, my grandpa, Hoppy, had to quit school in seventh grade to work in the Chicago stockyards with his dad to be able to pay the bills for his family. But at nighttime, he learned to take night classes and he got bookkeeping lessons. He became a bookkeeper in a real estate office and then he got his real estate license and then he became a partner in a real estate company and then he went on to build subdivisions in the new suburbs sprawling out of Chicago and he became a very wealthy man. And he only had a seventh grade education. But what he did with a lot of the Dutch people all live in colonies and all these Dutch people all went to Wheaton, Illinois and he was with all these Dutch people in the Dutch colony of Wheaton, Illinois, where Wheaton College is at, where Billy Graham went to college. And um, with all these Dutch people, a lot of them were still immigrating in the 1940s and 50s from Holland. And my grandpa used some of his wealth to help these people become American citizens. And he would loan them money to make the travel from Holland to get the legal stuff necessary to become legal citizens. And he would give out loans to people within his church to help them with some of his resources. And I always remember when I talked to Grandpa about that, he said, yeah, I would help people, but I would never charge them interest in any of the help I gave them. Either give it as a gift, or if it was a loan, I would never charge interest because God gave me that money. It wasn't my money. God gave it to me, and I used it to help other people. And no wonder he did so well because God loves a cheerful giver, and if you give, it will be given on to you, Right? And when we're generous, uh, God has a way of making generous people be blessed even more so they can bless poor people. That's how God operates within his economy. And that's what I saw with my grandpa's life. And let's close it up now. It says, you shall not curse God, nor curse a ruler of your people. You shall not delay the offering from your harvest or your vintage. The firstborn born of your sons you shall give to me. 
You shall do the same with your ox and with your sheep. It shall be with a mother seven days. On the eighth day, you shall give it to me. You shall be holy men to me. Therefore, you shall not eat any flesh torn in pieces in the field. <laughs> you shall throw it to the dogs. In other words, roadkill is not to be eaten. That's a word for our culture. Those guys that picked up that deer that Daniel hit with his pickup truck, I have a feeling they might have ate it. But interesting, go back to verse 28. You shall not curse God nor curse a ruler of your people. Interesting. See the analogy there or the, the, the things that links, that's linked together? When you curse a ruler, you're not, you're not to do that in the same sentence. You're not to curse God. You're not to curse a ruler. Why is that? Because Romans chapter 13 says all government is ordained by God. And God, what God does is he's, he uses the governing rulers to fulfill his will. And so we're not to curse those that God ordains in government because when we do that, what we're doing is we're going against God's ordaining these people in that government. And that's, we got to be careful with that, especially here today. Because we're not real happy. A lot of us more conservative Christian people, we're not happy with some of the government we have right now. But you know what the solution is? It's not to bash our president. You know what the solution is? Pray. Pray for governing. All throughout the scriptures, we're told to pray for kings. We're told to pray for governing authorities. We're told to pray for those that are in leadership. Don't bash them. Pray for them. Pray that Joe Biden gets saved. And God gets a hold of his heart and brings him to Christ. Don't be cursing him. Pray for him. I think that's what it's talking about right there. Amen? We did it. We got through, through the restitution and the retribution laws. And uh, praise the Lord. It's back in Mike's court next week. But good stuff. You see the, see the way that kind of still blends into us as the people of God? Justice. He has shown thee, O oh man, what is good. What the Lord requires of thee, but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your gods. And so with our with your God. So let's do that, church. Let's be people of integrity. Let's be people of justice. Let's be people that interact with other people in a fair, integrity way. Let's not de denigrate our message because of our behavior. Let's and let's help people. Man, I look at the ministry of Jesus, my Savior, my Lord, the one I'm trying to follow. Jesus helped a lot of people. He helped the leper. He helped the prostitute who was probably Mary Magdalene. Uh, church history says she was probably not only possessed with seven demons, but she was also, also probably a prostitute. He helped the adulterous woman. He helped the tax collector, Matthew, that everybody hated. He helped people. He helped people that were helpless. Let's do the same, amen? You, you, they, they will know we are his disciples by our love for one another. Let's be known as Calvary Chapel Christians by our love, by our kindness, by our graciousness, by being fair and honest and just with people. Amen? Amen. And let's help some kids tonight, too. For goodness sake, you guys, come on. Let's sponsor some of these kids tonight. Let's make that happen tonight. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word tonight. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. Thank you, God, that you are a God that's gracious with us. We need it. We are, we are sinful people that make mistakes all the time, and you have such patience with us, Lord. And you're so gracious towards us, Lord. And even though in a lot of ways we're helpless, Lord, you help us all the time. You are so, so good to us. The evidence of your goodness is all over our lives. And your promises and fulfillment are all over our lives. And so, Father, help us to be people that help others. Help us to be people that are just, that are merciful, that are helping even the helpless, Lord. And I pray, too, for this fundraiser dinner we're doing for Greg and Heidi on Saturday night. May we just raise a ton of money for them, too, and just help them with this crisis that they're in with their, with their son, Everett, who's five years old and has stage four cancer. God, I pray that this dinner 
on Saturday night, we just might have a, not only a great time of fellowship, but a great time of helping Greg and Heidi and Everett, Lord. Father, get, lay upon our hearts those things you've called us to do, Lord, as your church, as your body, as your bride. Help us to keep being the salt of the, salt of the earth and the light of the world, Lord. Help us to be a world-changing church and world-changing Christians, God. Help us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, Father. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said.